Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we open your word this morning, we do ask that you will hold us close, that you will speak to us and we will hear what you have to say. As we think about taming our tongues, we ask that we will see those weaknesses in us stripped away through the power of your love. We ask that your, the power of your love will work in us and through us each and every day and that we will open ourselves up to that love more and more. And we ask these prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. This morning we're looking at James chapter 3. If you want to turn to that in your Bibles, James chapter 3 and verses 1 to 12. James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. If you're using one of the core Bibles, it's on page 1214, page 1214. And uh, if you picked up a set of message notes on the way, then they'll help you as we look through this passage together. Again, for those who perhaps haven't read Grapevine yet, uh, from next week in Sunday morning meetings, rather than producing message notes um, to help us through the sermon, we're going to produce a resource called Going Deeper, which is something that you can take home with you after the meeting and look at the Bible reading that we study on Sunday mornings again um, and use that resource over the other six days of the week um, as you open the Bibles um, at home or wherever it is that you do your uh, daily devotions. And uh, hopefully that will also help us get closer to what God is saying to us through his word. Have you ever said anything that you instantly regretted? I imagine Jeff on the video earlier this morning instantly regretted thinking that the lady was seven to nine months pregnant when she'd only found out the week before. We've all probably said things that we've regretted. When you have said something that you wish you hadn't, have you had the opportunity to take those words back? No, because once those words are out of your mouth, there's no way that you can put them back in. Once we say them, they're said, and we have to deal with the consequences. Unless you're on Twitter, because on Twitter you can say things that you later regret, and you can actually delete your tweet. The problem is, of course, however many hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions of people that have seen that tweet before you get a chance to delete it. And if they manage to screenshot it or somehow save it, then it can come back to haunt you. There are quite a number of famous instances of people saying things on Twitter that they later regretted. Some might think that the President of the United States does that on a daily basis. I've not chosen him as an example. But there are others. Rita Ora. Hands up if you know who Rita Ora is. Or some of you are with, her, with it. Good. British pop singer, for those who don't know who Rita Ora is. She uh, once regretted a tweet uh, when she was trying to engage her fans on Twitter. But it backfired because she once put, once tweeted out that she would release her new single, her new song, on Monday if she got 100,000 retweets. That's where people share the words that she's used. Now, she had nearly 4 million Twitter followers, so you would have thought 100,000 people retweeting what she'd said wouldn't be too difficult. The problem for Rita Ora was that only 1,000 people retweeted, so she was nowhere near her target and quickly deleted the tweet to save her any more embarrassment. Going to Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding. I'm white. Oh my goodness. That was a tweet from a lady called Justine Sacco, who uh, tweeted it just before she got on a flight to Africa. And despite the fact that she only had 500 followers, it went viral, it went round the world, so much so that the hashtag, has Justine landed yet, went round the world while she was still up in the air flying to South Africa. You might be surprised to learn that her employers, a media company called IAC, parted company with her shortly after that very bad tweet. Politicians are not immune to these things either, and neither are journalists. In September 2013, BBC Newsnight 
editor Ian Katz accidentally sent a message to his 26,000 Twitter followers describing the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Rachel Reeves, as boring snoring after she appeared as a guest on the show. In response, Miss Reeves issued what was an apparently sarcastic reply, simply saying, thanks. Mr. Katz later had to write an official apology to the Labour Party for his words. Do you remember Chris Hune, Liberal Democrat politician? He became centre of the speculation that he was secretly trying to undermine a colleague, as if politicians did that to each other, by accidentally making public a private message on Twitter. He wrote in October 2011 to a Guardian jur journalist that he needed to keep his fingerprints off a story so it needed to appear as if it had come from someone else. He quickly deleted the message, but not before quite a few people had seen it. And probably my second favourite one is an internet sensation that was born on the April the 28th, 2011, when Shadow Chancellor at the time, Ed Balls, accidentally tweeted his own name when he was searching for his name on Twitter in the search box. And uh, it went out to his thousands of followers, and he didn't delete it because he didn't know that you could delete tweets, so it stayed there. And so people on Twitter, I don't know if Stuart does this, but people on Twitter still set up, celebrate Ed Balls Day on April the 28th. And last year... Mr. Balls actually honoured the occasion by retweeting his original message and saying, well, it would be rude not to. But this is probably my favourite. Labour leader Ed Miliband, who was left red-faced in January 2012 after he bungled the, what might seem like a simple task, of tweeting to mark the, bet the death of Bob Holness, who was the presenter of Blockbusters. His tweet read, Sad to hear that Bob Holness has died, a generation will remember him fondly from Blackbusters. Oops. And that became particularly embarrassing, and a particularly embarrassing time for Miliband, because his shadow health minister at the time, Diana Abbott, had apologised for racist remarks that she'd made on Twitter only a few days before. You can delete tweets, but you can't delete what you say. What we say and what we don't say are both important. It's not only about saying the right words at the right time, but it's also about controlling ourselves not to say what we perhaps want to say but shouldn't. Our tongues disclose the real us because there are no limits to what we can say. There's no inbuilt restraint or boundary. You can say anything. And it's only after they come out of your mouth that you may then find yourselves in particular constraints and consequences. If we gossip, if we belittle others, if we swear, if we brag, if we manipulate people, if we lie, if we exaggerate, if we complain, and if we constantly flatter other people, then that says something about our hearts. John MacArthur says, and this um, quote is in your message notes, nowhere is the relationship between faith and works more evident than in a person's speech. What you are will inevitably be disclosed by what you say. It might be said that a person's speech is a reliable measure of his spiritual temperature, a monitor of the inner human condition. The rabbis spoke of the tongue as an arrow rather than a dagger or sword because it can wound and kill even from a great distance. It can wreak great damage even when far from its victim. The Bible variously describes the tongue as wicked, deceitful, perverse, filthy, corrupt, flattering, slanderous, gossiping, blasphemous, foolish, boasting, complaining, cursing, contentious, sensual and vile, and that's not an exhaustive list. And in our passage this morning, James sees the tongue, as, J as John R. MacArthur says, as a test of living faith, the connection between what we say we believe and what we actually believe do. The tongue represents our inner person because the tongue only produces what it's told to produce 
by the heart. Listen, listen to these words from James. James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and Derek is going to come and read them to us. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example even they are so large and are driven by strong winds they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go likewise the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes great boasts consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Amen. Let's just put those words and James's letter into context, first of all, because I think it helps us to do that. James wrote during a particularly difficult and tense political situation. Does that ring a bell with anybody? A tense and difficult political situation. The Roman world at this time was suffering from huge economic problems. There were different factions of Jews that were fighting each other. And then there was this growing revolutionary resistance from the zealots in Judea. And eventually the zealots revolted against Rome in 66 AD. And that led to a huge outbreak of violence in the region and the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. That was the situation in which James wrote this letter. He wrote to help Christians to live in a world that seemed to be going off the rails. And he wrote to help them to live with integrity and to represent Christ in that world and in that situation in the best way possible. Now, he was wise enough to know the wrong word in such a volatile situation could light the fuse of yet more violence, strife and misunderstanding. That's why he said it's really important what you say. You might be able to delete a tweet, but you can't delete a wrong word in a wrong situation. In verse 5 he says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The wrong word in a wrong situation can only create an uncontrollable blaze that will cause irreparable harm. And so James says that in view of this, pay attention to the source of your words. In verse 11 he says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? This isn't a difficult sermon to follow this morning, I hope. It's pretty black and white, isn't it? A 
fountain, a spring cannot pour forth both fresh and salt water from the same source. Like begets like. A salt spring produces salt water. A fresh spring produces fresh water. A fig tree cannot bear olives because a fig tree bears figs. And an olive tree can't bear figs because an olive tree bears olives. What James is saying here is that a tongue that produces curses as well as blessings is a contradiction to genuine faith. And he was only following, of course, what his brother Jesus said uh, in his ministry. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, uh, 34, for example. He says to the Jewish religious leaders of the day, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? can't be done it's impossible how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks what James is saying here is pretty black and white he says that someone who gossips for example isn't a genuine Christian doesn't have a genuine Christian faith Somebody who belittles other people has a faith problem, a heart problem. Someone who swears isn't fully surrendered to Jesus. Someone who brags isn't growing the spiritual fruit of humility. Someone who manipulates others doesn't fully follow Jesus. Someone who lies, someone who exaggerates, someone who's always complaining or flattering other people contradicts the idea that the Holy Spirit is living in them and working through them. At least all of those things, if bad things come out of someone's mouth, then it raises the question about whether the heart of that person has been properly cleansed, properly rinsed by God's powerful spirit. James simply says to Christians everywhere, see that your lives are lived in consistency. He wants us to follow Jesus as closely as possible. As Tom Wright puts it, to be a blessing only people rather than a blessing and cursing people. To be a blessing only people rather than a blessing and cursing people. I admit that's a high standard and it's a standard I don't reach all the time. But as Christians, we are called to use our tongues to spread the good news of the message of Jesus Christ. That's why it has to be such a high standard. It's a high calling and that's why it's a high standard. Fresh spring water, if you've ever drunk fresh spring water, you know that it's life-giving, it refreshes, it cleanses, it brings blessing, it's necessary to life, and it brings delight. And the Bible says that if we offer it to God on the altar, then our tongue has the same potential power for good. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4 says, The word of a man's mouth are deep waters, the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. You get this idea of fresh water, fresh, clean, pure water. Our tongue, when given over to God and to the Holy Spirit, has the potential to proclaim the life-giving message of salvation. It can cleanse and bless others with God's word. It can heal, it can worship, it can bring delight in every situation. So how do we do that? Do you bring delight in every situation and every word that you say? Hands up if you're perfect this morning. No, again, we still haven't found any perfect people. Well, it would probably help if we thought before we spoke. Did your mum ever tell you to count to 10 before you you speak? Sometimes I have to count to 20 or 30. Our speaking has to be controlled and it has to emerge from the deep well of God's wisdom. That's why we need a few moments before we speak because we actually have to dig down into that wisdom before we can say the right words. So James says we should be slow to speak. 
Now, I don't know about you, in this age of instant communication, I think it's getting even more difficult to be slow to speak because we're expected to give an instant reaction to whatever it is that comes to us when we're confronted by an idea or provocation. Those of you who are on social media, you're missing out on so much bad stuff. Good for you. Because people react to each other and provoke each other and, you know, over politics and all sorts of things without even thinking, without stopping to think what it is that they're writing. But we can do that in our own lives. We don't have to have social media, do we? Sometimes we respond to people in the wrong way because we don't wait and think. So when we're tempted to respond to someone, we can choose to give it five minutes if that's how long we need, maybe even longer before we do so. And then we might even choose not to respond at all after that period of time. Because a heart that's fully given to God will recognise that sometimes it's best, well not sometimes, it's always best to focus on thinking about and responding to the right things rather than thinking that we have to respond to everything. I don't know if you noticed in our passage, but James seems to think that there is no hope of ever taming our tongue. Did you notice that? Verse 8 says, No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Is he right? Well, I suspect that in human terms he is. No human can tame the tongue. There is just one person who can do that for us. Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can tame our tongue. He will do it for us. He will cleanse and heal our hearts. He will ensure that our hearts are fresh springs, not salt water ones. It's his Holy Spirit who gives us the power to control our tongues. It's his Holy Spirit that gives us that moment to say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to stop and think before I respond. It's his Holy Spirit who gives us the power to control our tongues, which often we seem incapable of doing ourselves in our own strength. He will give us more and more power to monitor and to control what we say as we ask him to help us. See, there are times when we feel offended. There are times when we feel unjustly criticised. And we want to react. We want to say something. We leap in to respond. But it's the Holy Spirit that can remind us in those moments that God loves us just as we are and there's no need for us to react and to feel as if we have to defend ourselves. Often we're hurt by someone else's actions or words. It's then that the Holy Spirit can help us and stop us from lashing out. So this very simple sermon ends on a very simple point. Let's give our Give our tongues to God this morning. Give them over to him. Recognise we can't control, control them and tame them ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. Maybe first and foremost, we need to give him our hearts first. And say, will you cleanse those? Will you make those fresh spring hearts rather than saltwater hearts? And then ask him to use us to be a blessing to others we're going to sing an old hymn it's song number 300 in the songbook and it simply says throughout these five verses I think gracious spirit as you are as you are as you are the spirit of Jesus Christ in this world I want to be like that too I myself would be like the Holy Spirit and in this first verse we come straight to the point of James chapter 3. Gracious spirit dwell with me, I myself would gracious be, and with words that help and heal would thy life mine reveal. The words that we say reveal how much the Holy Spirit is living in our lives. We're going to sing these five verses together, and if you need to respond this morning, or if you need to just come talk to God this morning, then our place of prayer is open.
And if you want to come and do that on your own, then bring something in your hand. If you want somebody to pray with you, then come empty-handed and we will do that. But let's sing these five verses together. Father God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would indeed be with us, would be in us, would be in our hearts, making them clean and fresh and full of your power. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be in the words that we speak to each other and to others that we come into contact with 
in this coming week. May what we say shine a light for you and spread your good news to those around us. We ask these prayers in your name. Amen.